Welcome everyone and thanks so much for joining us. My name is Angela Fellen Baker and I'm the Communications Officer with the American Library Association's Public Programs Office. I'd like to thank you for joining us today for this online learning session, which is the third session in our four-part series on convening deliberative forums. This session is presented by ProgrammingLibrarian.org, which is a resource website of the ALA Public Programs Office, and is presented with support from the ALA Cultural Communities Fund. Today's session is part of an ongoing initiative of the Public Programs Office under the leadership of the ALA Public and Cultural Programs Advisory Committee to present professional development opportunities for libraries that support civic engagement initiatives. Many thanks to the ALA Center for Civic Life for being a tremendous partner in this effort and a special thanks to all of our presenters today, um, including our chat moderators, uh, Debbie and Betsy, for all of the work they've done in putting this series together. Just a reminder that this session is part of a four-part series, so if you haven't already registered for the final session, please be sure to do so at programminglibrarian.org. You can also find archived recordings of the first two sessions at ProgrammingLibrarian.org and if you are interested in learning about other upcoming opportunities uh, from Programming Librarian and the ALA Public Programs Office, please sign up for the monthly Programming Librarian newsletter while you're there. If you're interested in deeper engagement, with models of civic reflection. The Public Programs Office is offering a day and a half pre-conference at the ALA Annual Conference in Anaheim, which is titled Civic Reflection Builds Community Connections, a Program Model for Libraries. This in-depth facilitation training will feature the civic reflection model, which is appropriate for attendees from public, academic, special, and school libraries. For more information about that session, please visit the conference website, which is alaannual.org. And the Center for Civic Life is also holding a pre-conference at the ALA Annual Conference, which will provide attendees an opportunity to participate in a deliberative forum about privacy and also learn a little bit more about moderating. And more information about that session is also available at the conference website. Before we get started today, um, I'd like to set out some basic information about communication in this online classroom, and then we will move along to our presentation. If you experience technical difficulties, please send a private message to our technical support, Angela Hanshaw. You see her name there listed in the top left-hand corner of your screen. Uh, if you can describe your problem to her, she can help you work through it. Uh, to send a private message, just click on her name, Angela Hanshaw, and select Start Chat With, or Start Private Chat, and she can help you work through any technical problems you're having. We will have a Q&A period after the main presentation, but if you have questions during the presentation, please feel free to ask them in the chat box, and our chat moderators, Debbie and Betsy, uh, will be happy to help you out. There are handouts for this webinar available for, for download on the lower left-hand side of your screen. To download the zipped file, which contains several helpful guides as well as speaker biographies, click on Related Files and then select Save to My Computer. We will be working from the Success in School Ready for Life issue book in this session, so please do take a minute to download those files. And finally, if you experience major technical difficulties during this session, don't panic. The whole thing is being recorded and will be available for you to download and view whenever you have a moment at the program's conclusion. And that will be available on programminglibrarian.org. And now it's my pleasure to introduce our first presenter, Patty Deneen, from the National Issues Forum Institute. Thanks, Angela. Hi everyone, it's a pleasure to be with you today. I am Patty Deneen. I am presently located just outside of Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. This is the third of our four-part webinar series and we are going to spend a little bit of time today looking at a more detail about your role in moderating a forum. We're going to be using a combination of things today. We have some things we want to tell you, some things we would like to share with you. You're also going to be watching some video clips that we think are really pretty interesting and we're even going to ask you to participate a little bit at a couple of points. 
We hope that you'll find all of this really helpful. And as in the past webinars, as you have questions, thoughts, concerns, we encourage you to type them into the chat box. Our, our monitors are going to be really helpful in capturing this. We'll try to address these as we can. And it's also really helpful in designing future webinars. So thank you for your cooperation in that. As a moderator in a forum, You'll be doing slightly different things in different parts of the forum. A lot of forums are approximately two hours long, although the process is very flexible and some are longer. Most are not shorter. Two hours is probably typical. And the three broad parts of the forum include the opening, moderating the three approaches, and then spending some time closing or reflections at the end. And that's an approximate timing you see there. For today's purposes, we are going to refer to some things in the issue guide called Success in Life, Success in School Ready for Life. How can we help more students graduate from high school? We're also going to be using clips from forums that were held focusing on a different issue. In that case, the issue was immigration. And you'll find that there are lists of lots of different issue guides that have been prepared to help people deliberate about different um, issues. So let's take a closer look at what you do as a moderator during the opening. Of course, you'll want to welcome participants to the forum. You'll want to introduce yourself, a recorder and note taker if present. You'll want to introduce them and thank them. You'll want to thank the sponsors and anyone else who has helped you produce the forum and get everything ready. You want to point out some of the logistics, like if there's food and beverages. Can people uh, help themselves to that during the forum, or will, you, will there be a break, or will that be for after the forum? Where the restrooms are, if you're doing any video or audio taping, you'll want to let people know about that and let them know something about uh, your purpose in doing that. You'll want to let them know what will be done with the participants' input. And this is something that may vary according to what your goals are, if it's part of a project or not. And in our next webinar about convening, we'll give more nuts and bolts details about those kinds of things. You'll want to charge the participants with the work of deliberating. In other words, you want to set up a problem-solving kind of atmosphere rather than a debate or argument atmosphere. You want to point out some uh, very basic ground rules. This also helps set the stage for deliberation and makes a, a much more compelling atmosphere that creates deliberation rather than argument. You want to give a very brief overview of the essence of the issue and the approaches that will be considered during the forum. Or sometimes there's a companion video, as is the case with the Success in Schools issue book. And this does a really good job of giving the overview instead of uh, the moderator having to do it. And then before you launch the deliberation on the approaches, you want to spend a little bit of time asking just a few people to share their, sometimes we call it personal stake stories, or their personal connection with the issue. Let me take a couple of minutes just to take a closer look at those last three elements, the ground rules, the overview, and also the personal stake parts. The ground rules are a fairly short list of some basic things which really do help an awful lot. You do want to share those with people. They're all very common sense things. The moderator is um, guaranteeing that the moderator will be neutral. There's no agenda or preconceived outcome to the forum. Everyone's encouraged to participate and so on. On the left-hand side, you see a printed poster. And you can actually get a free set of posters by calling that number. Um, or it's on the NIF store that you reach through the NIF website. Or you can make your own. On the right-hand side, I just picked up a marker and made my own poster at a time when we didn't have enough posters. And we had a, had a few breakout rooms that we had forums in. So I just made my own. And giving the essence of the issue, the overview of the issue and the approach, is just as meant to be very brief and concise. Or you can show the video to do it. The screen you see there is just a, um, a capture from the video that uh, accompanies the Success in School issue book. 
When I get ready to moderate a forum, I usually read the issue material several times. I highlight things. I take notes. And then I identify and pull out some of the things that I think really highlight the issue and um, the approaches. So some things that I might pick from this particular issue book might include what you see here, for example, that 6,400 students drop out every single day. That research has shown that dropping out is not a sudden decision, but it's a gradual process. That when asked later, most students regret that they dropped out. And that by 2018, only 10% of all the jobs will be available to people without a high school degree. You might pick out different things. It's just to help people all get on the same page to start. The last bullet point you see there is just a statement of the purpose of the forums. In this case, this is the purpose that was created by the groups that uh, work together to create this issue material. So your organization, your library, or your committee may have um, a different statement of what your purpose is in holding the forum. And to talk about the personal stake before you launch people on talking about the approaches, this is just a way to get people thinking about the issue in um, personal terms rather than academic, partisan, or soundbite kind of talking. So, for example, what you see there, these are three different questions. You don't, you can pick a different kind. You just need to start with one. But they're all asking people, how does it affect you, your family? How, what concerns you? How does it affect your school, your community, or yourself? So let's give it a try. What's your personal stake in helping students stay in school? If you'd like to, you certainly don't have to, but if you'd like to and you think you have something you'd like to share for the next few moments in the chat box, if you'd like to share some ways, a story, an experience that you have that explains how you feel you've been personally affected by the issue of um, the difficulty of helping students stay in school, or someone close to you, or something that makes it um, obvious to you that this is an issue worth talking about. So we'll just give you a moment or two to, to do that, if you'd like to. And I'll tell you that some of the things that people say are very personal stories. Some of them are things that um, maybe it's their concern as a taxpayer because it might affect their community. And this only takes a couple of stories from people, one, sometimes two or three, and then the group is ready to move on to the um, consider the approaches. So let's take a closer look at what you will be doing as a moderator to help people deliberate about the approaches to this issue. And to help you do that is our next presenter, Nancy Chronic. Thanks, Patty. Now I'm going to take you through the deliberation part of the forum as if I'm moderating and you're participating. So after hearing how to begin the forum discussions, including identifying personal stakes, participants are now ready to begin the deliberation. So step one, as the moderator, you will explain that your job is to help the group work through the three approaches to this topic as spelled out in the issue book. To reiterate, as moderator, you will remain neutral, ensure everyone has a chance to participate, focus on the choices and keep time. And in this case, that means about 20 minutes for each approach. Step two, introduce the recorder. This is an opportunity, if you haven't already taken it, to introduce the recorder. Now you may wanna switch um, off with the court recorder, and if so, let the participants know. Um, sometimes, particularly if you're new at this, it's good to, one of you does the introduction, uh, the other one does approach one, and then you switch back to the first person, and so on, just so that you uh, get a little bit of a break. Um, you may want to do it that way, so, but if you're going to do it that way, do let the participants know. 
you should also um, let them know if there's a, if there's a note taker that's going to be um, joining you, that you want to introduce that person. So you would say, assisting us today is our recorder named so-and-so. The recorder will capture your comments briefly and effectively and make sure the recorder represents your views accurately. So step three, you're, not, you're now going to prepare to deliberate. You should have before you the issue book, Success in School, Ready for Life. Uh, this was uh, the book that is uh, available for download in the file um, on the webinar, or you might have gotten it in advance, and you can also get it on the National Issues Forum's website. So now let's turn to page four of this book, where we will begin with approach one. Now that means page six if you um, have a PDF version or page four of the actual printed pages. So I want you to take a moment to read over the possible actions, concerns, and trade-offs. We will then begin discussion of the pros and cons, costs, consequences, and trade-offs of approach one. So here we are in step four, which is approach one. As you can see, approach one is to invest more in youth development with a broad focus that includes physical, intellectual, social, civic, and emotional growth. So before you um, on the slide is the actual page that talks about or summarizes approach one. Now the, this page also lists six possible actions and several potential concerns and trade-offs. I want to turn now to a video that shows you a real-life version of opening the forum. In this clip, I serve as the moderator of a forum entitled The New Challenges of Immigration. Um, this was done in State College, Pennsylvania, oh, we... the Public Issues Forums of Center County, Pennsylvania. You'll get a sense of how easy it is to open that deliberation portion of the forum, so roll video. So oh, why don't we start? by taking a look at approach one. That's on page 27. I'll give you a minute to look at it. I know some of you haven't had a chance to read the book, which is fine. Uh, the video gave you a little bit of an introduction, so we're on some common ground here. But take a look at what approach one is uh, recommending, what we should do, and what are some of the uh, trade-offs. And then we'll start talking about them. Talked about. So why don't we start? What, what do you like about this approach? What do you think makes sense here? So well, from my experience, I remember So like you just saw me do in the forum on immigration, you can open the deliberation with a very simple question, like, what do you like about this approach, or what don't you like? As the discussion proceeds, you want to probe for pros, cons, trade-offs, consequences, and costs. You can consult the issue book and or the moderator's guide for good questions. Um, in this case, the guide actually has some of those questions. So I'd like you to now consider yourself to be one of the participants in this forum and type into the chat box your response to question one. What do you like about approach one? Uh, success in school ready for life. Again, refer to that page six of the PDF or page four of the printed issue guide. Um, and we'll get a sense of how you as a group would respond as participants in this forum. Debbie Abloff and Betsy McBride have been working as, as uh, monitors, as I see Carolyn Kaywood is also, and they're going to be highlighting some of your responses for discussion later in the session. So we are on approach one. So the opening question, we already uh, gave you some ideas of opening with, say, what do you like about this approach? And you may not need to make uh, to need to ask further questions to keep the conversation going in order to get a sense of the pros, cons, costs, consequences, and trade-offs. People may just take off with it, and they often do. 
But if you sense that your guidance is needed, you can use some suggested questions and follow up with comments only when necessary. Remember, as we, we talked about in the previous webinar, silence is fine. You um, should try to inhibit yourself from jumping in. It's really up to the group to do the work. So remember that the issue book offers some questions like what are some examples of this approach in our community and elsewhere? Now we've given you lots of helpful questions that are in the uh, Center for Civic Life Public Deliberation Handbook that is available for download uh, from the webinar. We also have it on our ALA Connect site and you should have gotten it last time if you were on the webinar. So these are just some examples of the many questions we give you. These are generic questions and generally speaking, those generic questions work really well because what you wanna do is probe. You don't necessarily want to get into the specifics of the content. So when you're asking about cause and consequences, um, you can just say to somebody, you know, if they're suggesting that some, some approach be taken, you might say to them, what be, would be the cause or consequences of doing what you're suggesting? Or what be, would be an argument against that option you'd like best? Um, so you're probing to try to get them to recognize that there's pros and cons, but there's also trade-offs and consequences. So is there a downside to the course of action that you're suggesting? suggesting? So if everyone in the group seems to agree about the approach, and that happens sometimes, you might ask, what would someone who disagrees with this pro approach find objectionable? And often, that might mean somebody who's not in the room. And it's important to recognize that uh, there are opinions probably of people that aren't represented at the table. So it's a good idea to think to bring them in. Okay, next step is step five is go to approach two. So you're gonna have had 20 minutes of discussion on approach one. Um, when you go from approach one to approach two, sometimes you get a perfect opening. Um, uh, by where the discussion is. Other times you might have to sort of uh, jump in and say, well, maybe now we should move to approach two. Okay, so approach two is about making, uh, keeping education rigorous and relevant to enable students to proceed in a global society and pursue their individual goals. So again, the possible actions are listed here, potential concerns and trade-offs, and then there's some uh, questions that are offered in the book. So approach to questions. Um, you can start off the same way you did other times. What are the advantages and drawbacks of this approach? And then you can get into some of the specifics that are in the, the, the book, like what are some examples of this approach in our community and elsewhere. But again, your need to ask questions is limited to when you really need to help guide the discussion and or if people just seem to get stuck. So. Let the group do as much of the work as possible. So the next step is to move into approach three. And you're gonna follow the same format you did for approach one and two. And by this time, you should be getting really good at it. So this approach is about building strong relationships between students and caring, capable adults to provide guidance and support. Again, we have possible actions, potential concerns and trade-offs and our set of questions, which is opening with some, you know, a question about perhaps the advantages and disadvantages, and some of the similar questions that you saw in the previous approaches. So here's some tips for successful moderating. First, you wanna let the group do the work. It's easy to wanna jump in and try to get people encourage people to do what you think they should do. But in fact, you're gonna be better off if you let the group do the work. And we're gonna show you a video in a minute or two that shows how the group can really do the work themselves. And silence is fine. I encourage you to inhibit your natural reaction to want to guide the discussion. Let the group do that. Second, you wanna foster storytelling about personal experiences with the issue. You want people to make it their issue. They've probably already done that in the uh, when they uh, talk about their personal stake. Um, and you wanna make it as personal as people are willing to do. 
Third, you want to encourage different viewpoints. This is not about consensus. This is about really surfacing different views and then deliberating and dealing with those different views. Four, you want to let tensions surface with civility. And you're going to see a little bit of that in the upcoming video. Fifth, you want to support deep listening, and that's really important. And finally, you want to help participants understand why others feel the way they do. So a really successful forum is one where people go from talking about, about the situation in the third person, and then they move to talking about their own experiences, and then finally they move into we. So I'm going to ask you now to refer to the document downloaded today, helping moderators stay on track. I've given you some tips and a checklist um, in, in, the, in uh, the, the previous screen. So now we're going to um, watch a clip. So when you watch this clip, see if you can, and this is from the same forum on uh, immigration in State College. See if you can identify some of the factors that we listed under tips for successful moderating or, uh, or, or apply some of the factors that are listed in the Helping Moderators uh, matrix while you watch the video. Listen to the conversation and watch the bat body language for cues. I think you're going to find that as interesting as anything. Feel free to comment about anything you're um, experiencing or witnessing in the chat box. Um, about what you're observing in the exchange, et cetera. And note, um, if you haven't noticed already, this forum took place in a school library. So hopefully those of you who are school librarians will realize that these forums are for you. Okay, roll video. United States um, has, has a need for that, for that labor pool also. There's two features of this approach that concern me and one is the emphasis on homeland security. I think there's too much fear generated in this country against people from other countries and I think that this pro approach seems to highlight that. And the other thing is that I don't think you should make people learn to speak English. Teach is the word they want. But, but I think you should encourage them. You know, you can sponsor programs and opportunities for people to learn English so that they, they see it as a tool to assimilate and maybe even to further themselves. And um, I lost track of that. Do you oh. believe that English be the primary language in a school? Well, I see the difficulty. I worked in the middle school for a number of years as a speech and language pathologist, and it was always a difficult thing to sort out what children were having difficulty academically because there was some inherent program, maybe they had special needs, or was it a matter of their learning English? And for a middle school child, it takes like five or six years before they become proficient enough to handle academic language, especially if they come from a family that wasn't academically oriented to begin with. For instance, if they were people who lived out in villages and their own cultural language wasn't really very rich, there's not a lot for them to build onto. So it is something that our schools struggle with. And uh, we really, I don't think, in the middle schools provide probably enough assistance to those children. But I think since this is civil discourse, our definition of historical immigrants, as we've spoken around the table, parents and grandparents, it was their desire to learn English, and they identified themselves in very broken English as, I'm an American. Okay. My observation doesn't necessarily agree with point number three. I think we have a much larger identity to our culture than the original immigrants. Okay. The man who gets off the boat at Ellis Island and learns his, earns his citizenship and says, I'm an American, don't call me Lebanese, who today his grandchildren say, I'm a Lebanese. But don't you think some of that has to do with the, the for example, my great-grandmother um, was from Germany, 
but was embarrassed to be from Germany because of World War II. And, and I think that we have become a more uh, accepting society in terms of understanding that there's value in diversity. And so I don't know necessarily that people are not identifying with being American so much as embracing the fact that they represent um, another background or another element to, uh, they, I just don't think people are as ashamed as they used to be. I don't, that, at least that's Is there a experience. difference between ashamed or lack of pride? Why is our campus full of students identifying with various cultures, identities, nationalities versus an American? Well, I guess, it, how do you define American? I don't American? know. This is yeah. civil discourse, right, Nancy? <laughs> I'm just asking a question. <laughs> <laughs> if we all agree, then it's not a very interesting discussion. Well, but we want to we want to have a surface those tensions, and I think those underlying tensions are part of how we make policy. We're not going to agree on a lot of things, and that's fine. Yeah. Well, and I I, I guess I would just offer that I I'm not quite sure how we define American. Is it is American, um, you know the the Ernest Hemingway of the world, or is American Maya Angelou, or you know. Who, what what do we call American? How should people identify themselves as being American? Um, well, I, maybe one of the things is whether you even want to learn the language or whether you want to be accommodated with your own language. I frankly believe you should learn the language of the country you go to, whether uh, you know people coming here or if I would immigrate to another country. I should learn their language. I guess I would, would say, in terms of the language, that I think people So I hope the video gave you a sense of how the group does the work and how different perspectives can service in a civil manner. Uh, my limited role was simply to help the group manage the conversation. Uh, this video also lets you see how people personalize their experiences with the issue and how they listen deeply to each other. Um, and I hope you notice some of the body language. Anyway, um, a few additional reminders to for you. Um, one is to manage your time so that each approach get considered equally. And when you get really involved in some of this discussion, uh, you may find that uh, it's, it's easy to, to want to really continue, but you have to find a graceful way to move between each uh, set of approaches so that you do weigh, uh, give each an equal opportunity to be weighed. Um, you want to redirect the questions to the group, as I did in the video. Um, you're not there to answer the questions, you're there to help them have the discussion. Um, you want to check in to ensure that the recording is uh, successful and that it represents the ideas presented by the participants and the poor recorder may be writing away the whole time without being acknowledged. So every once in a while it's probably a good idea to bring them into the room and at least acknowledge them and see how they're doing. And one measure of success my mentor provided was, you're doing a good job when the group members and not you are doing the work. So finally, a few words about handling moderator challenges. If you attended webinar two or watched it online, you would have heard more about handling moderator challenges. These are covered in our Center for uh, Civic Life Public Deliberation Handbook that you can download today. Um, or they're also on our ALA Connect site. But remember, the better prepared you are, the less likely you are to have problems. But just in case, we wanted to make sure that you know a little bit about how to handle these challenges. And for many of you, you've probably done this in other settings. So for situations like participants who dominate or talk too much or talk too little or uh, assume too much of an expert role or misinform the group, Ask questions such as, what do others think about this? What ideas have not been expressed? Or how would you respond to the concerns just expressed? Again, it's an effort to bring the others into uh, the, the 
the conversation. You do not need to do much other than encourage others to participate. Finally, let me remind you that we have a public deliberation handbook uh, that you should have downloaded or can get on our ALA Connect site. Um, it can give you guidance about a lot of the technicalities, like how to ask good questions and how to deal with challenges. So now let me turn over the mic to my colleague, Carolyn K. Wood, who recently retired uh, as a librarian from the Virginia Beach Public Library and now serves as a fellow of the Hampton Roads Center for Civic Engagement and a member of the ALA Center for Civic Life Advisory Committee. Carolyn? I'm Carolyn Kaywood, and um, I had the privilege of doing success in school just a week ago with a group here in our local area. It was an interesting uh, conversation that um, raised all kinds of issues I hadn't thought of. But I have to tell you that one of the most, not difficult, but uh, things you've got to really hold in mind as a moderator is that while you can get all involved in deliberating the three uh, different ways of looking at things, uh, you need to save time, as Patty pointed out at the beginning, for a period of reflection. Uh, that can be difficult when you know the library is about to close, but plan ahead and reserve about 20 to 25 minutes at the end uh, because this is where we form the bridge from the conversation into action. We use a little guided reflection to move out of deliberation mode and think about what's gone on. And to do so, we begin with internal reflection. Ask people to th think quietly to themselves for a moment. Just reflect on these things to um, see, did you gain something from this conversation? Do you have a sense of what is too valuable to trade off? Have your views changed or expanded or shifted in some way? And then, after a moment of quiet, you move on to uh, approach it with, uh, as a group. Where did we find the most agreement? Sometimes there's a lot of common ground, but as Patty has reminded me, sometimes the only commonality that we find is that this is a difficult issue. One thing to be um, very focused on here is don't force some kind of consensus. That's not the purpose of a deliberation. If it arises naturally, that's wonderful. If there's a lack of agreement that is no reflection on you as a moderator. So are there concerns in common? Um, find out what's the most difficult thing about this. What divides us even now? And we're doing this in the library. What might we actually need more information about? One thing to be very careful here is to avoid the group's temptation to begin deliberating all over again. Now I want to show you a portion of the National Issues Forum video that they prepared for their uh, Deliberating in Public Schools kit. This shows a teenager who's acting as a uh, moderator for her fellow students. Watch how she introduces this reflection phase of the deliberation. Also, while you're at it, watch the boy in the red shirt. And think about, are they reflecting? Or are they re-deliberating? Okay, roll it. And move towards shared public judgments about important issues. All right, now that we've looked at all three choices relating to this issue of kids and violence, what we need to do now is try and come... As actual choices are set aside and students decide what is valuable and what consequences are acceptable, new ground is reached, common ground for action. And we have Matt who's going to keep notes for us as we brainstorm and come up with our common ground. Most people agree that the mentoring is a good thing and a good aspect of it. And then if the mentoring doesn't work, then you got the, the 
when you guys are talking about more discipline, that's where your discipline can I come into. That's, mentoring can be another component that can they can work together, but I think discipline should be number one. And then I think it also seems like we could pretty much discount that when we were all talking about the mental illness part of it, that that was something that we thought was too obscure and generally agree on is a we do live in a violent society. Um, wars are always happening all the time. Crimes are always being committed. At the end of the discussion. So, thinking about actions, uh, what needs to happen first? Things have to happen in sequences. What uh, ideas, what actions might be the most doable, the most feasible? Uh, what trade-offs are people willing to make? And how are we going to take care of the people who lose something in that trade-off? Now, we're all good librarians, so we always allow time for evaluation, right? You may have a paper evaluation. You might do a, a follow-up online survey. Uh, this could be for your own administration, or maybe you have a partner organization that needs information for something. But in addition, uh, the National Issues Forum likes the moderator to do a little bit of a report. And some of the things it asks us to listen for are, first, the obvious, what kind of a participant group did you have, the number, the demographics, the diversity of views, what was difficult, what was held in common, what kind of things did people value, where, where were they on the various trade-offs, and did they, in fact, identify a shared direction for action. And with that, I'm going to turn it back to Nancy. Thanks, Carolyn. So the next thing we want to do is talk about your homework and you doing a forum. So what we'd like you to do between now and our next webinar is try moderating your own forum with your colleagues or your friends. So use an issue book, either the one we um, have been using today, the NIF Success in School Guide, or perhaps um, the one that ALA produced, Who Do I Trust to Protect My Privacy? Um, we are encouraging libraries to actually hold this forum during Choose Privacy Week, May 1st to 7th. So it's a perfect time for you not only to try it out, but actually do it in your library. Um, we've got a moderator's guide as well as participant materials available, and they, um, we have an ALA Connect site for you with all of those resources. You may also want to look at the National Issues Forum site um, under the issue guides and see if there's other topics that um, you would enjoy doing. Certainly, my experience with doing the one on immigration, it was a really rich discussion and one that gets at issues um, that uh, you, you often find that people agree and disagree on things that you would never expect. Um, we also encourage you to continue the conversation on our ALA Connect site where we've set it up so you can uh, continue to discuss whatever happened here. And we hope that you will be putting um, putting information today into the chat box so we can also respond to any concerns that you have. So, and we remind you that our fourth and final webinar in this series, which will focus on convening forums, is going to be on Tuesday, May 22nd, same time. Um, you need to register separately for that. Um, we also have the archived webinars available at programminglibrarian.org. If you'd like to um, go back, and refresh yourself before you do your practice and or hold a forum of your own. Um, and you also um, should consider registering for our pre-conference, um, which will be the forum, Who Do I Trust to Protect My Privacy? It's a chance for you to jump in on a topic we know that you're interested in, but also get more familiar with uh, how, to, how to moderate and actually get firsthand experience with one of these forums, which we hope today by bringing you the video of others in a forum will give you much better sense of how all this works. 
Finally, stay connected to us on ALA Connect and our sub Center for Civic Life blog. So if you have questions, um, we are uh, eager to uh, discuss anything and everything that you um, have been learning about today and or uh, talking about in the chat box. Um, and we'll see who is available. Um, I'm, I'm happy to, to uh, field some of those questions, but um, we've got all the rest of us here as well ready to help. So I know that um, there was some interest in what do you do about the quiet person? And we've had a great deal of chat about that. Um, and I mentioned uh, on the chat that um, that people may seem reluctant to speak up, but in fact, sometimes they're just really good listeners and they're taking it all in. And if you can find a way to, uh, to tap them without um, making it too conspicuous, either saying something to them like, I see, Joan, that you've been thinking hard about this. What, what, uh, what kind of uh, ideas do you have about this problem? Um, or something else, some other way that you can tap into them with their body language. Um, lots of times they actually feel welcomed when they're asked to uh, speak. And I find that the quiet ones are often the ones with the most profound statements um, and, and thinking about it because they have really listened carefully um, to what others are saying. And as you saw in the video, uh, people really do listen to each other. Uh, when you when you set up some norms, they're not screaming at each other. There was plenty of tension in the room, and as the forum went on, there was plenty more tension. Um, but they were definitely very civil to each other and listened to each other. So I'm just looking to see if there's any other questions. Let's see from Stacy. By far the most difficulty we're having is a move to action. People want to take action afterwards, but they also want us to lead the action and seem to be disappointed and let down by the fact that we are not. And maybe I'll ask Carolyn Kaywood if you could jump in on this one. This is a good one since you have so much experience with it in Virginia Beach. Okay, but I want to start with a caution. This, this is a decision the library needs to make about what their role is. They may choose to lead a particular um, issue in their community, or they may say, that, no, our role is to convene and moderate, and you, the citizens, are the ones that need to um, do your citizen thing. Um, in Virginia Beach, we have gone beyond that on a couple of occasions. We got very involved in the issue of land redevelopment, of all things and provided uh, organized information in a website and hosted a lot of uh, forums and participated in the final re the writing of the final report. But that, that would be something for each library to see how it fed into their strategic plan. Not an obligation just because you agreed to do civic engagement. So I might say a little bit more about action, which we'll cover in the convening part of the form, of the um, webinars next time. And that is, is that when you go to plan one of these events, you will want to surround yourself with partners who are involved with the issue. And they can be just concerned people or they can be action groups. Um, and in those action groups, you have potential for follow-up action. So to give you an example, when I was in State College, we did one on emergency planning. And we included um, all the different planning agencies in the county and people like the Red Cross, et cetera. And they all came together with us and lots of citizens as well. And we talked through the issues, but one of the things that they who worked together a lot never thought about before is 
there's a public voice here and they weren't bringing the voice of the public into their little closed circle of planning for any kind of disaster that might happen. So what they concluded at the end of the forum with the public voice and the public there at the forum is that it would be really great if they could put together a citizen's guide to emergency preparedness. So lo and behold, they got people to work on it. And by the next um, election cycle, I was actually at the, um, the, the county planning agency for, uh, on voting day, and they were giving out to the citizens who came to vote their new emergency preparedness guide. So, you know, um, this to me was a really great action and also a great um, uh, reflection on the part of those who participated that were so-called experts recognizing that there were actions that they hadn't even thought about because the public wasn't at the table. And these actions could be very concrete and very helpful. So another thing about convening is, and, and one of the things that we did when I was in state college was, all the different groups around it, a particular issue, we would encourage them to bring brochures and other kinds of materials that they would want to hand out to people who come to the forum so that even if there wasn't a specific series of actions that were agreed upon by the group or next steps, that there would be um, the representation from these organizations and they could see that there were groups that dealt with the issue and now that they were much more um, familiar with the issue, they might seek out these groups, and so that also let the groups feel that they had a role to play, and it was a great place for them to, uh, to, to get more visibility and more participants in the work that they were doing. So I know Judy asked about a forum on a topic and a plan to include who might be responsible to address the issues. And I think that's one of the, the fun parts of this process, but also one of the parts that really um, encourages librarians to act as librarians, is that you know trying to identify who in the community is involved with these issues um, that might be, want to come to the table and help plan and help, help us bring people to the forum. So that who is a really important question to always be asking. The more diversity you have at the table, the more interesting the forum and the more reflective of the community it's going to be. And so just like we do at the library and trying to think of who are we not reaching and how do we find communities that might be invisible to us, we need to think really creatively who can be at the table. Uh, what kinds of people might be able to contribute. So for example, um, we did a forum on energy futures when I was in State College and one of the key players who had never done anything like this before was the man who ran the recombinant bike shop. And he had the opportunity then to share with people about his approach to saving energy and people got exposed. But you know, he was not the typical person from the utility or uh, an academic who focused on energy um, solutions, but somebody who really contributed uh, greatly to the discourse. And, you know, I was just delighted to make contact with this person. And he had not had much interaction with any of the people at the table or had participated much in, in other activities at the library. So there's great opportunities here. So I see uh, there are several of you are typing. Let's see what else. Let me ask Carolyn if you want to jump in here. Sorry, I was typing and I can't type and click on the microphone at the same time. My brain just won't stretch that far. Um, I, I was talking about... Um, I'm not sure what you asked me to jump in on, but I was talking about what you might do to help people who have kids that need to be watched and need transportation to the forum and, and need something to eat that evening and so on and so forth. And you might, um, depending on 
your purpose in a particular form, you might find a partner organization that could help you handle those things. Um, look around your community and see who else is interested in this stuff. That's something we're going to talk about uh, in the fourth webinar. So I noticed that Miriam has said, can we send invitations to people we really want at the forum? Absolutely. Um, for example, someone really affected by the issue? Absolutely. You know, try to get people who you know will have a, uh, be interested and have a voice um, to the table. And, you know, it's, it's usually your problem is not too many people. It's usually too few people. So, and, and particularly too few of diverse people. So be prepared, and we'll talk more about this next week, to um, have multiple sessions going at once. I mean, that's one of the, the great opportunities that a library offers. It, often there's more than one space in that library. So when we did the Energy Forum, we had 150 people show up. It was the first forum we did at the public library, and we'd been getting maybe 20 to 30 people at forums before that. So we had 150 people show up, but we were ready. And uh, we had seven groups, and it was marvelous. And I know that somebody was asking early on about the taping issue. So in State College, the uh, local cable station actually taped every one of our forums. That's why I had this video for you. And they would show them several times, and they now make them available on the internet. This one was bef was in the DVD uh, era, but they now have them available on the internet. So what I would do if my group was the one that was going to be taped was say to people, um, ask people if they um, if anyone was uncomfortable, they could go and join another group. But I found in all the years I did these um, that maybe only one person in all that time ever asked to leave. And they did not seem to be affected at all by the fact that the media was covering them. And I know libraries and librarians are very concerned about privacy, as are several of the people hosting the webinar today. Uh, but, um, but people like to be heard. And I think that they are extremely thoughtful. And they want to be part of public discourse. So the interesting piece to me is how comfortable people are speaking out and being public about uh, what they feel on, on these issues. Others might want to um, jump in here as well. Um, we only have uh, about a minute left. So Okay, so not hearing Carolyn or Patty jumping in here. Um, I think we're just about out of time. You can continue in the chat box, but we're going to turn it back to Angela and let you, cl uh, you know, close the session. Thank you, Nancy, and thank you to all of our presenters today, as well as Betsy McBride and Debbie Avalock for all the help they've been providing in the chat box. Uh, just so all of our participants know, uh, you will receive a follow-up survey to this session uh, that will arrive in your email sometime tomorrow morning. And when you get that, we do ask that you take a few minutes to share your feedback with us. That helps us a lot for planning for the next session as well as planning for future sessions on programminglibrarian.org. Uh, final thank you to the ALA Center for Civic Life and thank you all for joining us. Please remember to sign up for the final session, Convening Forums at Your Library, which will be held on May 22nd um, at 3 p.m. Central. That's the same time as today's session. Um, thank you all for joining us this afternoon and have a lovely evening.